The 17th most common question asked by the non-Muslim regarding Islam is that why do Muslims believe in life after death? How can you prove logically about the year after, about life after death? And many a time there are non-Muslims who pose this question to me. Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. You have given a lecture on Quran modern science. You are so scientific. But how do you believe in this blind belief? Life after death, science hasn't proved it. So they pose the question that if Islam is a logical religion, how do you justify life after death? I tell them that life after death is not just a blind belief, it's a logical belief. And I've given the talk on Quran modern science, and I've said that there are more than 6,000 verses of the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 verses of the Quran, they speak about science. But today, Science hasn't advanced so much to prove everything of the Quran. So if we analyze, say approximately 80% what the Quran speaks, which is related with science, has been proved to be 100% correct. 20% it is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. We don't know. So when 80% of the Quran is proved to be 100% perfect, according to scientific facts and 20% is neither wrong neither right not even 0.1% of the 20% has been proved wrong my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and 20% is ambiguous my logic says that inshallah even that 20% would be correct so it is a logical belief it is not a blind belief this is one way of proving life after death the other strategy I use to prove our life after this is by asking a common question that is robbing good or bad and I'd like to ask you that question here from the audience is robbing good or bad good or bad bad who says robbing is good raise your hand no one mashallah mashallah Large audience, maybe more than 15,000. Not a single person says robbing is good. Now, I am trying to impersonate. For example, I am a logical person. I am a scientific person. I am behaving like a non-Muslim, like an atheist. But I claim myself to be a logical person and a scientific person. And I say that robbing is good. Believe me, I am a logical person, I am a scientific person. I say robbing is good and I like robbing. And I am giving you a chance, this large audience of more than 15,000 people, I am giving you a chance to prove to me robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. I've told you, I am a logical person, I am a scientific person. Give me one logical reason why robbing is bad for me and I will stop robbing. I will tell you why it is good for me. When I rob a person, I can go and eat biryani. I can go to a five-star hotel. Easy, easy money. Now you tell me why robbing is bad. Don't give me 10, 20 reasons. Give me only one logical scientific reason why robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. Can anyone give me? Yes, brother. If you rob someone, can you speak a bit louder? MashaAllah. Very good. 
Brother Singh, if I take something from someone, I am taking away something from him. I agree. It is a loss for that person, but benefit for me. I agree with you. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. It is bad for the person who has been robbed. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. I am logical. I am scientific. I agree it is bad for the person who has been robbed. Tell me why it is bad for me. I will stop robbing. Yes, brother, loudly. Someone will rob me. Will I like it? Very good. Brother, I am a big mafia. I have got 100 bodyguards and all of them are behind the stage. I am a big robber. I am not a small robber. For a small robber, it is bad. Someone may rob you. I am a big mafia. I have got 100 bodyguards all behind, you know, all with AK-47. I am logical. I am scientific. I am a big robber. For small robbers, it is not good. Somebody may rob you. So, why it is bad for me? Yes, brother. Hello, my name is Nadeem. Why is robbing bad for me? Because uh, you will be bad for other people. I will be bad for other people. I agree with you, my son. Why it is bad for me? I agree. Because your name is going to be bad. My name? My name is very good. <laughs> Why it is going to be bad? I'm telling you, if my name gets bad, I have no problem, as long as I'm benefiting. When I rob someone, maybe 100,000 dirham if I rob, I can go to a five-star hotel, I can see a movie, I can enjoy, I can eat biryani. Easy money. Other people are just logging out. Me, I get easy money. You know, robbing is very easy. Anyone? Someone will say that the police will catch me. The police cannot catch me because the police is on my payroll. I have the ministers in my pocket. I have the police in my pocket. I'm a big robber. I'm a mafia. Most of the countries, the police and the ministers can be in your pocket. They're on my payroll. So therefore, whatever answer you give, in no way, and I've done this exercise in audiences larger than this, 50,000 people, 100,000 people, no one so far has been able to tell me one logical reason, I am a non-Muslim. I am a non-Muslim. Very logical, very scientific. No one can prove to me why robbing is bad. You want to kill me? I have got guards. Before you kill me, my guards will kill you. Yes, brother. What I think why it would be bad for you is because when you start robbing, you will, you will be collecting a lot of wealth. Very good. That, that wealth, you'll be worried about keeping it safe. And um, that, that is, will take your sleep away, it'll take brother. safety away from your family, and it won't give you peace of mind. And when you lose your peace of mind, you lose everything. Brother said, if you have too much of wealth, difficult to keep. You know, there are many wealthy people sitting here. Difficult to keep, very easy to keep. There are many banks here. Why? I won't keep in my pocket. You know, now you have got credit cards, you have got checkbook. For you, Who's a small man, when you get 1,000 dirham, you're afraid my 1,000 dirham will go away. I'm a multi-billionaire. All these banks and all, for me, it's very safe. If I keep in the bank and everything, a lot of profit, a lot of interest. Whether for small people to keep a 1,000 dirham, they're worried. For me, I'm a billionaire. But then again, you'll be worried about banks losing all the money with the recession. And these are, these are, these are, these are, these are natural calamities. Brother is saying that if I keep it in the bank recession, I'll own the bank. The banks have no problem. What do you know that even in recession, it's not only in bank, you can keep in wealth, you can keep in real estate. It is one option I've given you. You can keep in shares, everything. If the recession goes down again, it will come up. Dubai has gone down again, Dubai will come up. Yeah. It's going to come up. It will take four, five years. I'm so big, I've got no problem. Then there's no answer to that. Yes. No answer, I will give you the answer. <laughs> I agree with you. There is no logical reply why robbing is bad, why raping is bad, why cheating is bad. Now we turn the sides. You are the non-Muslim robber, logical, scientific. I am a Muslim now. I, the Muslim, I agree with you that logically to prove Robbing is bad. 
is very difficult except what I'll do first I'll prove to that person the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I've given the talk is the Quran God's word it's for two hours I don't intend giving the talk here in that talk I've proved logically scientifically to the non-muslims with the help of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists after I've proved to him the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 40 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree the non-muslim will tell me you are talking about Allah I believe in him but you are saying that Allah is not unjust I want to know and ask you this question I do agree with you that for a person who's robbing he would enjoy it but if the same evil is done to someone who's close to him will he like it if suppose someone robs his father will you like it and the answer is no someone robs his uncle will you like it the answer is no so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just there is so much of injustice done in this world there are many robbers we know they are robbing yet they live a luxurious life they have mansions they have palaces and they die and everything is over do you think that this book can have any relevance to modern science doesn't it stand the test of the time sure it does let me discuss with you the scientific precision of the glorious Quran join Dr. Zaghloul An-Najjar in Islam and Science tomorrow at 6 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 7 p.m. UAE on Peace TV where truth is hidden misleading quotations create confusion where truth is hidden lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion where truth is hidden manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge this very hidden truth creates false propaganda mayhem chaos disorder and turmoil in our lives and the world order but is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth? And who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik. Tonight at 9 p.m. and repeat telecast at 7.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. The reply is given in the glorious Quran. In Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. Allazi khalaq al mata wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Kullu Every soul shall have a taste of death. And the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. Whosoever is saved from the hellfire and enters the garden, the paradise, he has achieved the objective of this world. For this world is goods and chattels of deception. So Allah says, the final recompense is only on the day of judgment. That means only believing in Allah is not sufficient. One of the pillars of Iman is, besides believing in Allah and the prophets and the books and the angels and the Qadr is to believe in life after death. Without life after death, only believing in Allah is not sufficient at all. Therefore, one of the pillars of Iman is Akhirah, life after death. And we know that there are many robbers who are powerful there are many thieves who are powerful mafias are powerful some of them get arrested some of them get punished in the world many of them go unpunished so what kind of a test is this so I will tell this rich person who's a robber 
who's powerful i agree with you you will enjoy in this world you will sleep peacefully easy earning but what about the akhirah what about life after death there has to be a life after death only logically without life after death the life in this world cannot be justified when we talk about justice for example you may have heard of hitler he insinuated 6 million jews today if you arrest him what punishment can you give if hitler was arrested by the police what punishment could the law give him of this world maximum one death what about the balance 5 million 999000 999 people he killed you can only justify one death but in the akhirah allah says in the quran in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse 56 that as to those who reject our signs we shall cast them in the hell fire and as often as their skins are roasted we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain so if allah subhanahu wa taala wants to incinerate burn hitler 6 million times he can do it if allah wants to burn him 12 million times he can do it in the akhirah in this world whatever your police catches you can maximum compensate for one death that's the reason logically and to justify that robbing is bad raping is bad bribing is bad there has to be something like akhira there has to be life after death without life after death only believing in god is not sufficient only believing in allah will not justify why robbing is bad why raping is bad why bribing is bad except with the concept of akhira as allah says in surah al imran chapter 3 verse number 85 kullu nafsin zaiqatul maut every soul shall have a taste of death the final recompense is in the day of judgment the 18th most common question asked by the non muslim is that if all the muslims they believe in the same allah they follow the same quran they believe in the same prophet then why are muslims divided into sects the reply to this question is given in the glorious quran in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 103 Where Allah says, "Wa ta simu bihabli Allah jamia wa ta faraku." Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The double emphasis. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly. The second emphasis and be not divided. The rope of Allah. It is the glorious Quran. Allah says, "Hold to the rope of Allah." That's the glorious Quran and be not divided. Allah says, "Atiyu Allah, atiyu Rasul." Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. In Surah Nisa, chapter four, fifty-nine. we have to strongly hold to allah and the sayings of the prophet and be not divided allah says in the quran in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 159 that if anyone breaks their religions and divides the religion of islam into sects o prophet you have nothing to do with him allah will look after his affairs allah subhanahu wa taala is telling that if anyone breaks his religion into sects and divides his religion o prophet you have nothing to do with him allah will look after his affairs on the day of judgment but when we ask the muslim normally what are you so some say i am a sunni some say i am a shia some say hanafi some say shafi some say hamali some say malki some say deobandi some say barevli some say ahli hadith some say salafi some say jamaat e islami some say tablighi what was the beloved prophet what was he was he hanafi was he shafi was he humbly what was he what was he he was a muslim allah says in the quran in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 52 isa alayhi salam was a muslim allah says in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse 67 that ibrahim alayhi salam ibrahim peace be upon him was not a jew or a christian he was a muslim and allah says in the quran in surah fusilat chapter 41 verse number 33 woman has to call me man dail allah wa amil salihun wa qala innani minal muslimin who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of their lord works righteousness and sees that i am a muslim qala innani minal muslimin and sees that i am a muslim and the master key for dawa which i have mentioned in several of my lectures the master key of dawa 
and the most important verse according to me in the Quran of Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64 is, Pull Yahya Kitab. Say, O people of the book, Ta'ala wila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na wada illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate the partners with Him. Wala yattakhizabad dunabad dan arbaban min dunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallah. If then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu. Say we bear witness. We are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah. I am a Muslim. We are Muslim. No less than 22 places in the Quran. Allah says, call yourself a Muslim. Call yourself a Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, when he did dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told that, make my children Muslims. All these aimas, all these great scholars of Islam, the four aimas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu bin Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on them all. I love them, I respect them all. All these are great scholars of Islam. All of them. When you ask them, if you ask Abu Hanifa, may Allah be with him. Who are you? What reply will he give? What will he say? I'm a Muslim. We love these scholars. We respect these scholars. All the scholars said that if you find any of my fatwa, which goes against Allah and his Rasul, you throw my fatwa on the wall. We love these scholars. We respect them. But all of them came to get us closer to Islam to make us a practicing Muslim, not divide our religion. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, Ya Allazina Amanu, O you believe, Atiullah, what you Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who have been charged with authority, wa ulil amri minkum, who have been charged with authority amongst you. So people say, believe in Allah. Believe in the messenger and believe in the scholars. But they're putting a full stop where there's no full stop. The verse does not end there. The verse continues. Obey Allah and obey the messenger and those who have been charged with authority, the ulama, the scholars. But if they differ, go back to Allah and his Rasul. If they differ, if any scholar, if you find all the scholars say the same thing, you don't have to do research. All say pray five times, no problem. All say fast, no problem. But if two scholars differ, you go back to Allah and His Rasul. Where is the question of dividing the religion? That's why beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's a Sahih Hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, Hadith number 4579. Our beloved Prophet said, There will be 73 sects in Islam. So people say, The Prophet has prophesied. The Prophet said, There will be. The Prophet didn't say, Make. The Prophet said there will be 73 sects. Prophet did not say you should make sects in Islam. Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 159, do not make sects in the religion of Islam. The Prophet predicted there will be 73 sects. He didn't say you should make. There's another hadith, a Sahih hadith in Tirmidhi. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that there will be 73 sects in Islam out of which all will go to hell except one. The Sahaba asked which one? He said, those that follow me and my companions, those that follow Quran and the authentic hadith. So if you stick to the Quran and the Sahih hadith, you are on the straight path. So in Islam, there is no divisions and no sects in Islam. Islam is only one. The Quran is one. Our beloved Prophet is one. We have to follow the Quran and the authentic sayings of Prophet Muhammad إلهي لا تعذبني فإني إلهي لا تعذبني فإني مقر بالذي قد كان مني فما لي حيلة إلا فما لي حيلة